authorization regime. So if you want to issue those, you must be authorized uh, to do so. And you can only be authorized if you have the necessary capital for it, if you meet the necessary prudential standards and governance structure, if you manage to reserve assets. Like uh, um, a redemption right at par for the tokens uh, which you you issue. Um, the best in the which that we usually see uh, around crypto communications with companies promising that if you uh, aspire to drive a Lamborghini, buying that or the other crypto will make sure that a Lamborghini will be parked in front of your door uh, in due time. So any of that language is prohibited because you don't want people to be tricked into uh, buying crypto believing that it is a good investment. It can be, but it usually is not. Um, so if you meet these obligations, uh, you can get a license, uh, um, you, you, get, you get authorized, and you can issue and sell your crypto asset uh, throughout the EU. The second part of the of the media regulation is what I call the crypto asset service providers regime. And to me, in respect, that is the most important part of the regulation because this governs all the entities that normal investors and consumers are actually dealing with. They do not deal with issuers, they deal with custodian wallet providers, crypto asset brokers and dealers, crypto asset trading venues, portfolio managers, and so on. So all the ecosystem of service providers that provide services to crypto assets. And to provide these services in the European Union, you will need an authorization from a national authority in EU, an EU member state. Uh, and this authorization is subject to you having some capital, having the proper government structure, and meeting other potential standards. But you also must comply with conduct with requirements out in MECA. Uh, very important conduct requirements are, uh, of course, disclosures, but also uh, that um, you must identify, manage, and mitigate any conflicts of interest you may have in providing uh, crypto asset services. Because in traditional finance, what we see often is that the combination of certain activities in the same group or in the same company prohibited because there are conflicts of interest between these activities. Mika is a bit more permissive about this, so that does allow uh, the combination of various activities in the same company or group, because that is what the market structure looks like. But um, in return, companies have to identify these conflicts of interest, have to report them, and have to mitigate them. There's certain activities which cannot be combined, such as, for example, if you operate a trading venue for crypto assets, you are prohibited from engaging in proprietary trading in crypto assets on your own trading venue, because that is a clear conflict of interest, which is also prohibited in traditional financial markets. The operator has to be absolutely independent and neutral and has to, organize, has to ensure that the market is fair and properly running. Finally, Crypto asset service providers will also have to monitor and report the cases of suspected market abuse and market manipulation. And that's crucial because all markets, whether they're financial markets, commodity markets, what have you, have a tendency to attract bad behavior and people that are trying to gain the market for their benefit and profit. And this undermines the confidence in the market as users perceive it as rigged. And therefore, if market manipulation is taking place, if there's insider trading or other abusive practices, these must be um, monitored for and they must be reported by the crypto asset service providers, the intermediaries. Um, now, these rules are currently being finalized, um, implementing rules are being adopted, and we will, um, uh, we will soon uh, have the final rules because they all become live on the 30th of December of this year. The stablecoin rules are already live since the 30th of June, but the rest becomes live at the end of, um, of this year. Now, um, you may say, well, this is a, a, a lot of regulation, and it, it probably is, but it's also an enabling requirement. 
uh, it provides legal clarity, uh, it provides passporting, um, and it provides confidence uh, for this. Now, although it's a, um, a, um, a lot of regulation, I also think that this regulatory framework, um, it's, it's a lot of regulation for what, what is still a budding industry, but I do think it's also a major vote of confidence of the EU authorities in the future and the promise of blockchain technology. Rather than dismissing blockchains and crypto assets as a fad, as a source of fraud and manipulation and crime, as many, for example, US authorities seem to do, the EU authorities believe that blockchain technology holds major transformational and competitive potential for the European economy. And that is why we chose to embrace and onshore the activity on our market rather than push it offshore and deny its relevance. To conclude, we at the European Commission, and I in particular, do in a way regret that so, still so much crypto and blockchain activity and attention goes to purely financial related applications. Because often these financial applications amount to little more than trading crypto assets for speculative purposes. And while I've got nothing against this, um, it adds little societal value to just move around tokens to trade tokens for speculative gains. The regulations which we have try to create orderly markets and shed sunlight on this, but ultimately, um, blockchain has so much more promise and so much more interesting and powerful applications. Uh, we hope, and I hope in particular, that builders will start focusing less on crypto asset trading and more on industrial and real world and main street applications of blockchains. Because failing to do this, we will never see the real potential of blockchain technology and therefore my invitation and call on you and everyone else in the blockchain community is to direct your energy and your effort and your attention not on the valuations of blockchain, not on trading crypto, not on the valuations of crypto assets, not on trading them, but on to unlocking the real potential of blockchain technology in real world industrial applications. Because finance, be it traditional or blockchain based, serves little purpose in and of itself. Finance, like blockchain and other financial uh, and other technologies, must be at the service of the wider economy and of societal objectives. And I hope that uh, if we together um, focus our attention on this, we will see the true transformational potential of blockchain as a foundation for a next generation Web3 based and metaverse economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, excellent talk. Very comprehensive. You've covered so many things in a very short space of time. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned this at the end of your speech about the non financial applications of blockchain. Um, there is a question uh, I was in Edinburgh yesterday and was listening to a speaker from Estonia on how they built X Road and other public services infrastructure. How do you see this, uh, the, the role of European Commission in, in, in non-financial uh, applications of blockchain, such as you know, healthcare, real estate, John mentioned earlier about tokenizing real estate and real world assets and e-voting and all those. So how harmonizing and coordinating these approaches of non-financial applications, which will have eventually some financial, I suppose, value when you tokenize either a healthcare record, not in not as in a crypto asset term, but uh, health data is valuable, personal data is valuable. So eventually it will be uh, considered as a valuable asset, whether you put any financial kind of uh, attach to, to it. So in terms of coordinating all these uh, activities among the member nations, um, do you think there will be a role of oversight from European Commission for, for those applications? Um, well, we can, of course, and we do support that by research and also with, with funding 
but we try to avoid regulation if regulation isn't really necessary. Now, if the technology or if these applications can't develop in the absence of regulatory clarity, or if member states were to develop widely diverging approaches and rules uh, that would segment what we call the single market, then that may motivate the European Commission to propose a harmonizing framework. But ideally, we do not we do not believe, and I certainly do not believe, in creating a market by regulation. Markets are created by entrepreneurs, by people, by innovators who come up with solutions. And we have to give them all the chance to develop their solutions and not start regulating from the beginning or saying that, well, we need this regulation to create the conditions uh, for the market to develop. Finance is different. And if you treat like assets, like personal data as an asset, and you, you look at it as something having value, which it doesn't really have value, then immediately people often stop building the application and start focusing on the value of the asset and start trading um, the crypto assets. And that's why we have all kinds of rules for trading of crypto assets. And we saw that, for example, in 2018, 2017, in the, in the um, initial coin offering uh, wave. So people were using were to issuing tokens to raise money for their venture to invest into developing a solution, but they ended up raising so much money and their tokens became so valuable that they stopped developing. They just sort of raised more money than they ever expected to make with their invention, with their application. And so the tokens never lived up to their promise because um, never anything was built. So this is a long-winded answer to say, really, um, we try not to regulate um, if we don't have to. In the financial field, regulation was clearly necessary and was often for. But in the other areas, we don't really have such calls, and therefore we prefer to uh, to not uh, not do that. Final word on this: I am from the financial services department of the European Commission, and therefore, of course, I'm much more familiar with financial services applications and regulation than I am with the non-financial services applications. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter.